for reason for inviting me to participate in your research day at a distance. Uh, I too am new to this technology, so good on us, I guess, so far. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that our, our under project, our uh, DIDAR grant, or DIDAR grant, is a really neat opportunity for someone like me, um, dealing with faculty development along with student development, because I'm not historically a drug abuse researcher. I'm a stress neurobiologist and now have about one year of experience in drug addiction research behind me. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about things that we're working on as part of our dinner program. So uh, as I said, I'm a stress neurobiologist, and I think everybody sort of understands inherently what stress is when I talk about it. Um, but there are a lot of different components to stress that, that affect the body response to it. So in general, stress is perceived as a challenge to homeostasis, but it can be a real threat that actually damages your physiology or causes a, a potential harm, or it can be something that's perceived it can be a physiological stressor, like an immune challenge or a, a hemorrhage, or it can be an emotional stressor, something more um, neurological and mental. It can occur on an acute or short-term time scale, or a chronic or longer-lasting time scale, and also can be um, experienced under different types of durations or events, how severe the stressor is and how long it lasts. So these are the things that are really important when you're talking about stress research, and just to kind of um, for the data that I'm going to be talking about. We use in our lab a chronic emotional stress paradigm that I'll talk a little bit about later, but it's a chronic or repeated emotional stressor such that we are trying to mimic uh, situations that humans would experience in a relatively uh, um, frequent fashion. So we do neurology and, and the physiological response to stress is fairly well characterized. Um, there are a couple of different responses that your body initiates in response to a stressful stimulus. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Can you see the pointer? Um, so, two main responses to stress that the body has. Um, one is your fight or flight response, which activates the sympathetic nervous system and activates your um, your blood flows to your muscles, increases your heart rate, increases your respiratory rate, things like that, that enable you to either fight off something that's a potential threat or to run away from it. The other arm of the stress response is your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Or Axis, which is the slower and longer lasting endocrine arm of the stress response that I have um, in red on this diagram, whereby the um, hypothalamus, the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, will induce the release of CRF or perpetrotin releasing factor, which then stimulates the anterior pituitary to release ACTH or adrenal corticotropic hormone, which travels to the bloodstream to reach the adrenal cortex, which then releases the corticoid. Um, like cortisol, and so the myriad of effects that cortisol and like corticoids have um, are also both characterized. Everything from immune inflammatory responses to muscle and brain neurological wasting to mobilization of body resources for energy. So these are the two um, avenues of the stress response that we look at in our laboratory, um, and we're trying to look at the ways that acute and chronic stress affects how the brain then processes that stress and has um, links to multiple uh, chronic disorders that are associated with this. So the link between stress and addiction, uh, to this audience, I probably don't have to explain this at all. Um, there's a directional relationship that's been established. Um, stress both increases vulnerability to use substances to begin with. Also, it was a major factor in relapse, um, especially a, an acute stressor with very high valence has a major uh, influence on relapse. And many substances, when they are taken, actually reduce the stress response in the body, like methamphetamine, for example. Um, so methamphetamine is what we're going to actually be studying, and so it's interesting that methamphetamine will actually activate the HPA axis and induce the stress response. But also, chronic stress can alter the effect of methamphetamine in the brain and the way the brain responds to it. So um, we're trying to bring these two factors together and examine what happens in the brain as a consequence. So the mechanisms through which it happens are unclear, um, but that's what we're hoping to sort of um, answer in the near term. So the research methods we use, we have these cute little guys up on the top left. Uh, adults don't have leopard nails or rats. We're actually going to be looking at females and adolescents as well. Um, we use our emotional stress model of restraints. It's a 30-minute restraint for either one day in the acute situation or two days in a row in a repeated or chronic situation. And then, of course, we have our unstressed controls. We're going to do some behavioral analysis where we're going to do methamphetamine administration under both limited and uh, escalated um, uh, access protocols. We're going to do tissue collection processing both for histology in the dispensary and then western blotting and fresh tissues to look at protein levels in the brain as well. So one of the uh, tools that we use in my laboratory a lot is called FOSS-based functional mapping and 
response to the neutral gene. It has low basal expression and so does the Google response to um, stimuli of all different kinds. And so the image on the screen there shows black nuclei that are immunohistemically staying for all sorts of expression. And so you can see that um, activated cells um, will have that black nucleus um, as an indicator. So this is a generic marker of neuronal activation. Um, and the, the beauty of this is, number one, we can look under a time course and see activation of, response, uh, activation of neurons in response to specific stimuli. And secondly, we are able to preserve our anatomical context because we can look at where the various activations occur. So I got one step further and look at the cross-sectional anatomy. This is a, a coronal section of a rat brain um, that has some indicated true genes. Um, again, mostly for this audience, you're going to know most of this already. Um, but we had the cortex, the cortex at the top that there was a critical thinking gym, we got learning and memory in the hippocampus. We have a lot of integration of sensory signals in the thalamus. We have emotional control in the amygdala, and we have hormonal control at the base of the brain in the thalamus. So all of these are involved both in stress and addiction. Um, and so we're looking at all different sorts of areas of the brain um, and looking at those blocks mapping. And so when we then take our stress paradigm and look more specifically at, for example, the hypothalamus, this is now specifically in the paradigm. And then control acute and repeated stressed animals that are immunohistochemically safe for fossil expression. So again, we've got the black dots that are in the activated nuclei, um, and hopefully you can see that the acute animal have a lot more activated neurons in this paramatricular hypothalamic nucleus or PDH than the other animals. And so there's a couple of things that you can see from data like this just looking at the images. Number one is you can see that the um, Soft expression is higher in the acute and looks to be lower in the repeated, so there's adaptation or a situation going on. Both of them are higher than control. And then the other thing that you can see, hopefully, is that the, the layout within the nucleus of where that soft expression, expression occurs is different in those conditions as well. So in the acute animal, we see mainly a clustering of the soft expression near control in the medium parts of your um, neuroendocrine neurons of the paraventricular, uh, whereas in the repeated, you have a, a different subset of activated neurons. It's more ventral, it's more lateral. And so it gives us, again, that anatomical context. We can see that activation is occurring. We can see that activation is occurring in this nucleus that is responsible for it, shape the stress response. And we can see under different stress conditions where in the nucleus that activation is occurring. So this is um, just the imaging of these scans, but then we can also quantify that. And these data are actually from spray dolly rats, but we have males in the wooden bars and females in the black bars. And on the uh, y axis, the number of fossil expression cells in that nucleus, in the PDH. Um, on the x axis, we have C that are the control unstressed animals, A is acute or one time stressed animal, and R is the repeated or 14 day consecutive stressed animal. And so you can see in both the males and females, the acute animals have the highest response in terms of fossil expression. And then both adapt in response to repeated exposure to the same stressor. Um, but you can also see that males and females have a little bit of a difference in terms of their neuronal activation. Um, you have a lesser absolute number of phosphorus cells in the female. If you, however, take that as a percent of control, it's actually equal. So while the males have higher to start with and have higher in acute, <coughs> the percent difference from control to acute in males and females is actually the same in these data. So we use this kind of um, data as a, as a beginning step. To map to all whether the stress response has in fact occurred, and secondly, to look at neuronal activation in other parts of the brain that are involved in um, stress and reward um, and other addiction related um, behavioral kind of things. So, the challenge for me, one of many challenges actually, is mapping these two systems onto one another. As I said at the beginning, the relationship between stress and addiction is pretty clear. Um, we know that there's a lot of interactive effects of those two um, conditions. But if you look at the neuroanatomy that's associated with either one, the PDH is in orange on the screen, and that's where our stress um, response is initiated from. And then in the purple is the cumbens in the ventral tegmental area, which is you well know as far as the reward pathway. And there's no arrow that connect those directly. So cumbens BTA are connected to each other. PDH is connected to a lot of other brain regions. Um, I'll carry the alphabet soup of the rest of the screen, but these are all hypothalamic. Um, and motor control regions that have to do with um, all sorts of motivated behaviors. And so you can see that there are a lot of 
potential pathway through which this connection could be made. CDH and reward pathway don't appear to connect directly with each other, but they can interact with each other through these um, intervening pathways, uh, such as the dorsal needle hypothalamus, lateral hypothalamus, the dorsal serotonin and serotonin input, um, things like that. So this for me is, is the, the really interesting thing and the challenge, just trying to figure out how these map on So for the current study, what we're working on is looking at stress, of course, because that's where my home is. And we're going to be looking at adult and adolescent stress, male and female ultimately. This is what we mainly focus on now. We're going to look at the dopamine work pathway and how that leads to addiction in terms of methamphetamine self administration. So we're going to look at some behavioral testing as well. So why are we methamphetamine? Um, we are a uh, uh, border relevant um, community relevant institution, and methamphetamine is not as huge problem in El Paso, but it's growing. Um, but it is also a very behaviorally robust and very significant social drug. Um, we, use it by, uh, we use it in our neuroscience lab because it's easily obtained um, in the market. It has a long half-life. It's what the silicon can get into brain cells fairly easily. It affects many of the dopamine system molecules and is ordered community relevant for our um, purposes for our VEDA project. If you look at it from a molecular perspective, there are a lot of targets that are in the neuron that methamphetamine affects. It actually reverses the directional transport of dopamine to the dopamine transporter, dumping it back out of the synapse. It reverses the DNAP, um, which will cause dopamine emptying from the vesicles into the cytoplasm. It will disrupt the dopamine receptors on the postsynaptic cell. It can decrease monoamine oxidase activity and, and result in changes in dopamine. It can have an increased synaptic neuron, and it can increase tyrosine hydroxylase or, or TH expression, which is the uh, great limiting enzyme of dopamine synthesis. So, there are lots of molecular targets we can go after the methamphetamine in the nervous system. So, finally, getting to some of our data, we started with our FOSS stress responses, and we looked at the interventricular and the EDH, which is where our stress systems always begin. Um, and then we looked at the accumbens, and we separated out the accumbens shell and the accumbens whole after this first half to look at what was happening with the um, activation of the neurons and the response to stress. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to stress and expose, and then we're going to let them behaviorally self-administer methamphetamine to see if there are changes in the nervous system induced by stress that then affect behavioral methane. So we're looking at the response to the neurons to stress here in adult males, and the white bars are control unstressed, the orange bars are acute one-day stress, and the yellow bars are repeated 14 day stress animal. And in the CPH, we see what we've seen before. There's a very strong FOSS response in acute males. Um, and the females after habituate. Um, we see a similar pattern, but non significant in the accumbent shell. And we see a significant activation in the accumbent core in response to acute stress. And then again, the suggestion of the um, situation, although that's also non significant um, in the accumbent core. So this is not so surprising in male rats, and I should say that this is right now, I believe, in minute four. So it's not, um, we're going to increase the anime and see if we can get some statistical differences in this first. Um, the really interesting thing we found is that the adults compared to the adolescent males, which are next, um, shows a really interesting, and I think very important point. So here we see nothing. And I will point out that the axis on the y axis is the same, the numbers on the y axis are the same. And so what we saw as far as acute stress responses in the adult males, we are not seeing in the adolescent males. It seems to be relatively impervious to the effects of stress, both in the acute and the acute condition. Um, so we looked at them actually in direct comparison. Um, this is very particular in the site where our stress responses are initiated. You look at especially at the acute situation in the middle there, the adult males have a much, much stronger response than the adolescent males. And so some of the features we've done before me have done a really excellent job of talking about risk factors for adolescents and, and the importance of intervening in drug use and, and, and substance um, experimentation with adolescents. And so I think we're looking at some sort of neurological input that would be really important for that as well. Um, the same is true for the new becomes core and shell. Both we see a, a much lesser response in the adolescents than we do in the adult males. Looking at the behavioral testing, um, this is uh, adult males that have been allowed either one hour or six hour extended access to methamphetamine self administration. Um, and so the top trace is the six hour extended access, and the bottom dash trace is the one hour limited access. And you can see at multiple time points um, beyond about 10 days, you see that the um, animals allowed to 
allow an extended access amendment that I do will actually sell to the minister more. And so I should point out that this is animals that were given one hour or six hour access but only tested, only measured in the first hour of their um, of their drug taking behavior. So we can see that we have a behavioral um, increase when allowed extended access and then that we so our goal now in the in the experiment that we're actually starting this week is to bring the two together. We now have stress pre stress pre exposed animals that we are allowing to go on that self administration which is not going to start on the coming week. So hopefully next year I'll be able to update you on what that shows. Um, but for now we have um, some images today that kind of pull the two together. Um, from Western blotting, we've looked at the dopamine transporter and paracetamol hydroxylate levels by Western blot in the striatum, and we have shown that the um, the level of fat appears to be increased in the striatum in extended access animals, um, where the pH doesn't seem to be changing. We have some interesting um, image chemical data that goes along with this that doesn't 100% agree, but there's a lot of difference in taking a striatum and doing Western blotting for total protein versus looking at brain sections that have roster caudal and dorsal ventral dimension. Um, so we're going to, to answer that a little bit more clearly. But for the Western blotting, we're seeing an increase in striatal fat in the extended access of methamphetamine animals. So to date, our summary says that the adolescent males um, appear to be somewhat resistant to the effects of acute and repeated emotional stress compared to their adult counterparts. Um, no good surprise that methamphetamine, uh, methamphetamine increases their self administration behavior, and chronic meth exposure increases that, but doesn't seem to change the case level for Australia as much by Western blot. So, in the future, what we hope to do is, is as I said this week, we're starting animals who are stress free, so doing behavioral testing. We need to reconcile those IHC and Western data to see if this is an anatomical difference or if there's um, some difference in the way that we're doing the, the immuno measures versus the Western blot. And then we're going to extend measures to include um, dopamine transporter and serotonin hydroxylase by, um, by immunity to chemistry. We're also going to look at the dopamine 2 receptor, which the previous speaker obviously um, um, did a great job of explaining why that's important to the system. We're going to look at uh, the dopamine D2 receptor. Um, and we're also going to look at those as well to see if we can start to quantify an accumulation of stress response as well. So I would be remiss to not acknowledge my pipe collaborators um, and the did our uh, program collaborators as well. This has been a great experience. Um, certainly the grant is the thing that lets us do all the fun stuff that we do and then especially um, the students that work in my lab and that work at the collaborators last um, great and support and again Dr. Thanks so much. <laughs> No, you should be able to pick up the, the, the ice cream cone. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, Dr. Goodman. Um, uh, first thing, are there any male differences? So we've done a little bit of the male female in the FOSS. We haven't got them in the amount of self-administration yet. Um, so in terms of stress responses and brain activation, um, the males are showing Types of the males, whether they are adolescent or adult. So, adult females are showing greater responses than adults, and adolescent females are showing greater than adolescent males. Um, so, it looks like the adolescent females are responding at about the adult male level in terms of neuronal activation. Um, we don't have any of the behavior testing in animals. Hi, yes. Very beautiful data. I was just wondering if um, you thought about correlating the CPOS expression with cord release, for example, and seeing the relationship in adults versus adolescents and males and females. Absolutely, that's a great question. So, so every study we do, we think we're going to force <laughs> and the answer is always yes. Um, so we haven't measured cord in this cohort, but we have done it previously, and there's a good literature that shows that cord is um, that this is, paradigm is established enough and shows consistent releases of the cord. In the acute situation, and um, I don't know what's happening with the females or the adolescents, and so we're about to take on those studies. Um, the correlation between FOSS and CORS, uh, there's really great data by Bob Spencer in uh, Boulder, Colorado, that shows that both can increase but don't necessarily have to be stepwise linked with each other. So, um, an increase in FOSS means an increase in CORS, but more FOSS does not necessarily mean more CORS. And so, we haven't done those studies, but Dr. Spencer has. 
very nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering, you are mentioning about the habituation to the effect of stress about mm -hmm. chronic stress exposure. What if you just change the type of stress that you are using? If you use, for example, under the stressor, would you see an habituation to the to the false expression? Yeah, also a great question. So the, we have not done chronic variable stress, but it's um, something that's very prominent in literature before question. Um, they do not adapt in terms of court responses that will have to come to do chronic variable stress. Um, we are not planning to use that just yet, but it's definitely a future direction that we'll consider. Um, we're not entirely we're not entirely sure that the level of stress that we're inducing now, especially because the animals are adapting, is going to be strong to affect the taking behavior um, because the mass response tends to be very robust. Um, but what we can say is that even though the animals adapt or habituate to the 14 degree of restraint, they also show um, an increase in state health stressors, so the that might be that. So what we find out in, in the behavioral will drive kind of our future plans. Um, thank you, uh, uh, President. Um, <laughs> <laughs>